In real life, when people learn I'm a geologist, a common question is, what do you do? I guess technically the most common question is, who are you and why are you out here? But I get some similar questions on my videos here, and I get some comments along the lines of, cool video, still don't care about rocks. And I'm sure some of these are trolls and jokes. But geology is a lot more than just rocks. And you might not know it, but geology directly impacts your life in meaningful ways every single day. When Trails and Tales came out, I did a short episode on what isn't geology. So now it's time to talk about what it actually is. Geology is an applied science, meaning that we use other sciences like math, chemistry, physics, engineering, and computer science to help solve our problems. And in short, geologists solve problems dealing with the Earth. Earth science is a very broad term that contains many different disciplines, and geology is a big part of that with its own diverse disciplines. What is and isn't considered geology versus some other part of Earth science can be a bit subjective. Instead of talking about the definition of geology, I think it's more interesting to talk about how it affects society and what are some things that geologists actually do. This will just be my perspective, but I work at a university and I have experience with a lot of different disciplines within geology. The most commonly thought of application is natural resources. This isn't just limited to oil, gas, and mining, but it also includes things like water, both surface and underground reserves, and soil conservation. We need to transition away from using fossil fuels, but that takes a lot of metals and other elements. Electric vehicles can require 70 kilograms of copper per vehicle, which is more than triple what a gas car requires. And the need for many critical minerals is expected to continue to grow rapidly for decades. An economic geologist isn't going to be doing the actual physical mining or drilling, but they will be the ones directing that work. They will be interpreting drill logs, doing analyses on samples, and interpreting those results to map or model the extent of an ore body. If you look at everything around you right now, all of the materials that make them up were either mined, drilled, or grown. And the stuff that was grown grew in soil, which is also geology. Soil scientists study the properties, chemical composition, structure, and the different stages of soil production. They map soil types and develop soil management practices such as fertilization, crop rotation, and deal with industrial waste control and mitigation. All this is vital for farming and keeping soils healthy and free of contaminants. They also monitor and control erosion, and it takes 100 to 1,000 years to make one inch of topsoil. In the American Midwest, we lose about 2 millimeters of topsoil each year, which doesn't sound like much, but that's 70 to 700 times faster than it's produced. Farm fields sit vacant for most of the year, just exposed to the elements, and besides the loss of soil, that lost sediment can contain pesticides and fertilizers, which will cause further issues downstream. Soils also play a huge part in our water cycle. They store and filter a large portion of our shallow aquifers. Which brings us to the next major area, hydrogeology. Hydrogeologists are extremely important, and they deal with the movement of water on and through the ground. This includes soils, but also rocks. They can deal with the construction of dams and wells for drinking and irrigation, as well as monitoring the quality of water to make sure it's okay for its intended use. This could be at a water treatment plant or municipal drinking source. Water from wells come from aquifers, and some of these took millions of years to fill, and we can easily use them faster than they recharge, and in many places, we are. The Ogallala Aquifer sits beneath most of the Great Plains portion of the U.S. and is one of the world's largest aquifers. About 2.3 million people get their drinking water from it, and it supplies about 30% of the water used for U.S. farm irrigation. If emptied, it would take 6,000 years to refill. This map showing the decrease in water levels is from the 1990s, but the pumping of water has accelerated since then, and the water used in the last 24 years equals what was used during the entire 20th century. The Kansas Geological Survey has released this map showing that some areas have less than 25 years of water left. If you don't know where your water comes from, I highly recommend looking into it, no matter where you live. Let's talk about some surface waters. Natural wetlands provide many critical functions. They support excellent biodiversity, they sequester carbon, and they are the major source for recharging aquifers. Natural wetlands are also critical just because they provide a place for water to go. Before the western expansion, the Chicago area was largely plains, wetlands, and wet plains. Now, so much of the natural wetlands have been paved over that there are issues with flooding because the water isn't able to soak into the ground. The Tunnel and Reservoir Plan, or TARP, was created to divert stormwater away from the city through giant underground tunnels and into reservoirs, two of which are old limestone quarries. This was a significant engineering project, and tunnel bore machines were first constructed to be used on it. Similar to climate change, wetlands tend to get politicized a lot, and the actual science can take a backseat. At least now, almost everywhere in the U.S., if you are building anything, you are required to determine if the construction will impact a wetland. And if you are, try to change your plan or take steps to mitigate that impact. 
This is what my wife's job deals with, and she is very excited for me to eventually do an episode on the swamp biomes. Water flowing through wetlands and percolating through soils and rock are the primary way that water is naturally purified. The processes we employ for mining can also produce their own problems. The biggest issue being acid mine drainage. Coal, copper, and gold mines commonly have sulfur-bearing minerals, and when they react with water on the surface, they produce sulfuric acid, which can then also dissolve metals, and that gets into our waterways, fish, animals, and us. Almost any industrial process can generate harmful waste, and without regulations, companies usually take the cheapest route to get rid of them. Usually this means damaging people or the environment. In the U.S., the Environmental Protection Agency has a program called Superfund that was created to investigate and clean up sites contaminated with hazardous substances. Out of tens of thousands of possible sites, there are about 1,200 on the national priorities list that can use funds from this program to help clean up the contamination. The Chicago area has a couple sites, and I've been to a few. The ground is basically just slag from the iron refineries that were there. One of the sites has a lake with a pH of 12.8, far higher than any natural lake, and amazingly it still has microbes living in it. Also, for some reason, people still fish in the nearby lakes, which are also contaminated to various degrees. Geologists that work with remediations usually are collecting samples, monitoring locations, running analysis, or running the projects. There are careers in environmental consulting, as well as local municipalities, state and federal governments. Environmental law is also a field that overlaps with this stuff, and yes, there are lawyer geologists. Let's talk about some natural hazards. I'm going to start a little earthquake here. Geologists study natural hazards like earthquakes, landslides, tsunamis, floods, and volcanic eruptions. And we have a pretty good understanding of these things as it pertains at least to the safety of humans. If you live in an area that could be affected by some of these, you generally know it. So while these can be exciting, there aren't many careers that are directly related to them. Most people that are employed in this field are either researchers for universities or governments or working for an insurance company. But there is a huge field of geology that can work with these hazards, and that is engineering geology. If I wasn't in research, this is probably what I'd be doing. Not all rocks, soil, and sediment are the same, and their structural and chemical properties vary greatly. You can't just build on dirt without understanding what it can support. There are plenty of examples of structures sinking, leaning, or collapsing throughout history, and some new constructions even have problems. Some places can't dig down to build on stable bedrock, so other methods are needed. Almost every construction has to have some understanding of the materials you are digging into, building on top of, or building with. <laughs> Our mining isn't just metals or other elements, but also the natural materials used for construction. This includes things like aggregates we use in concrete, the stone that's used along railways, and the material used in road work. Usually one of the higher costs in any road work is just moving the materials to the site. So locating a local source with appropriate materials is very important. Understanding the properties of these natural materials is critical to the success of any engineering project. I'm not going to talk about all the areas of geologic research, but something that surprises me is the number of people that don't realize that it's primarily earth scientists and geologists presenting the evidence for climate change and been trying to raise awareness of it for decades. I also come across the thought that geology is a solved science and there is no more work to be done, but that could not be farther from the truth. Earth science is in this golden age of research. Advances in technology and analytical techniques over just the past few decades have revolutionized our understanding of many topics, and there are a lot of areas that are still not well understood. It's only been 60 years since the mechanism driving plate tectonics was discovered, and it's crazy to think that we were already on our way to the moon before we understood how continents formed. And even though geology literally means Earth study, planetary geology is a major part of space exploration. It's geologists that are driving rovers on other planets, and the rovers themselves are little geologists taking measurements and making observations. And understanding other planets starts with understanding our own. Earth science teaching is its own discipline with unique challenges, and in many places it's not taught very well. Which brings me to the topic of the next episode in this little series. Why doesn't anyone know anything about geology? I hope you all liked this episode. I didn't cover everything here, and I'm sure viewers will have their own opinions from their own experiences down in the comments. I can almost guarantee someone will say they still don't care or try to offer me an obsidian knife. By the way, all of this is inside the geology world, and a new version is linked in the description. In the future, I may separate out these extra dimensions into their own worlds because the data packs I use are starting to add up, and the world size is getting a bit out of hand, so I might break them up and uh, make them a little bit more manageable. So I guess if you're watching this in the future, there might be multiple links for different worlds. That's it for now. I hope you have a nice day, and I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.
This episode took me much longer to put together, and I basically had to restart three different times. Uh, I ended up cutting a bunch of parts out. I'll explain more about that in the unlisted video for this episode. I also want to thank a few people that helped me out in this episode. Gamma02 from my Discord, they wrote a program for me that helps with some of these animations that I do. It's, uh, it's up on their GitHub, and I'll link that in the description. And I'll be talking about it in a tutorial video pretty soon. I want to thank YouTuber Dingy Fried. He helped me out by making the design for the dam here. I mentioned that I was thinking of adding a hydro dam into this diorama. And within like a day, he made the one you see in the video. So thank you very much. Also, he wrote my ending music. Just incredibly talented. Go check out his channel. And lastly, I've been doing dev streams uh, on Discord where I show progress for an upcoming video or get opinions on some problems I'm having. And the viewers have been very helpful with a few things. So uh, I just want to give a shout out to the nerds on my Discord. Uh, nobody calls them that. I just think it's funny. Thank you.